Some of you guys might have, if you're in Hacker Day, uh, might have followed the Arcade Hacker, uh, which I think he is looking at a uh, Capcom arcade system. I forgot what game it was, but uh, I think recently he found that there is a ASIC in there that's been just routing signals through the uh, this header that originally a lot of people thought uh, if you plug in something there, it just killed the board, but uh, apparently it's just looking for a signal and it just routes the uh, signals through that ASIC. So it's kind of interesting. And it's kind of amazing that, that uh, that's like one of the only few things that I can refer to that uh, actually implements sort of some sort of like pretty uh, like uh, pretty good hardware version and countermeasures because uh, they they definitely wanted to protect their IP in that board, but while doing so, they made it uh, they there's a, a finite time that that board can only work on because uh, there's a real time clock on there, or at least a battery that keeps the memory intact, and that will last for so long. That's why it's such an emphasis. I try to rely on those things. Yep, so here again, I'm going to mention PCDRE, which is a fantastic book. It's this book right here. And uh, chapters 2, 4, 7, and 9 are very applicable for hardware exploitation, which I know many of you are probably interested in. Uh, there's some really great strategies and tactics for uh, your RE challenges. And chapter 4 is by Jim Grant. Um, there's a nice overview of JPEG and some uh, advanced hardware projects. Uh, I like in the book that they actually go, he goes over um, secure JPEG, which is only right now just in the proposal stage, like it's just a concept. Uh, but it's kind of interesting to see what uh, the manufacturers are looking at to try to open some JPEG counterfeiters, because I think one of them was actually putting crypto or a key in there so you can just secure them. Uh, as far as I know, no one's done that yet. The only thing close to that, of course, is uh, manufacturers using their own proprietary tools that are JTAG like that can be quite expensive, you know, ranging from 100 to the you know, sky's the limit. And, uh, yes. and chapter 3, which uh, kind of hits the point of this talk, is uh, manual overrun, which that hits a lot of key points in hardware design, such as PCB stack layout, digital layout, and big signal, and that. Use a lot of trade ups and compromises made by designers. Um, sometimes those compromises can actually lead to some hardware vulnerabilities, just like, as I said, JTAG and just leaving things just labeled and white. And uh, it goes over some of your typical power supply technologies and animal technologies. So that when you look at a board, you don't go, like, whoa, that's, this is a really complicated looking board. I mean, look at it, break it down quickly, and Try to figure out how it works. And, uh, so, yeah, so some tools that I typically use, a nice soldering station. I have a, a I work uh, really high end hacko for a uh, soldering iron station, and then at home I just have the MX Triple AD, which is a very good general purpose iron. And uh, yeah, having a nice hot air rework station, which I think Bunny mentioned even this morning, and it's very important, and having a microscope to look at things. Uh, has anyone tried the, uh, the uh, SMD challenge? Wow. Wait, Diamond, you have a check on SMD challenge? <laughs> so, um, I think tomorrow they're going to do some, like, uh, drunk soldering or whatever, so, it, like, so the SMD challenge, I actually have a misery at this one, so, uh, goes down to, all the way to uh, over 1,005. Which is really small, but I'll make it a little Supposedly, I think actually after every component you solder, uh, you take a drink or like a beer. And, uh, eventually, yeah, I don't know how, you're, how people are going to get to that O2O1. I think like, someone was yeah. saying that, that one somebody was actually getting better after every drink. Yeah, so yeah. Like, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so th this is definitely a problem I face at work class. And so I just drink, I consume copious amounts of caffeine, so my hands get quite jittery. And, and like, on average, I'll just, you know, saw it, be sorry, like, oh, 0402. So sometimes I wish I didn't have an alcohol that beverage I just that, that down, so so to soothe the nerves. Yeah, yeah, the problem. Yeah, yeah. And just uh, make me a little calmer. But because I actually, yeah. Even even 0402s, which I know you can probably see on there, are 
Um, you just do them free-handed, but uh, they are still quite easy to lose if, if you're not careful if your tweezers on the squat into the ether or into the, um, <laughs> into the, just, well, like, into your carpet where they'll never be found over again. Uh, oh, yeah, so. so, and yeah, investing in a good multimeter, like, I, I really, I'm a really big fan of the blue multimeters just because of the really fast continuity tests and everything, and it just, this thing is built like a brick. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys have uh, the Harbor Freight multimeters, which uh, I don't use those anymore because one of those will actually blow up in my hand. Well, I was going to do something very early. I think it's like $12, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they, they, they give those up for free most, uh, sometimes, so. So Luke is good. Yeah, I love Luke, yeah. Uh, so, uh, EEV Block has a really nice video on where he actually shows that it's actually more the probes that determine how fast your continuity test is. So, yeah, even if you have like, yeah, like a $10 multimeter, you can actually make the continuity test a little bit more accurate and better by just investing in some good probes. So, you usually just want really sharp ones. Uh, so, and yeah, be, be careful with those because, yeah, there's, there's times where I'll just poke myself on the bench with them. Well, a few times I got underneath my fingernails. Don't do that. Oh, horrible. horrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. Uh, and so with multi-layer boards where there's uh, hidden traces or hidden signal uh, traces on your hidden uh, inner layers, those are kind of hard to trace obviously for the service because you can't see them. You're know, probably usually hidden by like a ground plane or something. And so uh, what I found best is some conductive silver stretchy fabric. So that's the thing, that's some fabric that you could probably find on Adafruit or uh, Sparkfun for wearables. It's, it works wonders, you just flip your one lead to your multimeter and then you just kind of like uh, brush it around. Unpower the board, yeah, you just have to unpower the board, obviously, otherwise it'll sort stuff out. But I'll just have it like uh, hooked up to one of, one of like uh, a signal wire. And I'll just like search around the board, and then uh, yeah, I've found I've saved a ton of time instead of waiting for X-rays from other people to look at their uh, single traces. So, um, does anyone have the awesome magic rewards? Yes. So this is arguably one of the, uh, one of my best reverse engineering tools because. On the ruler, there they actually have this nice reference with all the pitches that connectors use. And so, uh, when you want to, uh, let's say you want to, yeah, find a J tire you are for, and uh, it has a very small surface mount connectors. And uh, instead of just like tediously wiring uh, just jumper wires and have them end up breaking later, uh, what I usually like to do at least to work is just I'll just end up sourcing the connectors, you know, just. Put this down on the board, try to compare which pitch it is, and then uh, buy a connector and then some cables, and just use my device to pass around. Yeah. And yeah, that also has footprints for many various uh, components, so it's quite nice for also identifying sort of surface components. And uh, yeah, having a compare with Linux is nice, or Mac, because if you need a uh, the uh, DD image from a SD card, like or EMC card, it's really nice to have this design instead of dealing with Windows not uh, having support for some of those uh, file systems. So the device, the device, the device. Yeah, yeah. So because uh, most of the stuff I do, I'll like I'll be extracting VGA EMMC chips and then wiring 40 gauge or, or sorry 40 gauge wires for those and then routing those out to like an uh, SD card because you can actually read most of those EMMC cards as an SD card with just one data line and uh, clock and uh, command line. So, just a nice note. Now, NAND flash, which is uh, sometimes uh, mixed up with, you have to, on some of those chips, you have to actually get a controller chip, which is not typically easy to source, or you have to use uh, I think it's the FT232H chip to actually uh, to actually multiply the lines out and then get it uh, out the chip. And so, but yeah, anyways, Pure Linux makes that process a lot easier. Just uh, just have that chip uh, extracted and then just get it running and then all the 
hopefully, right. if it's not too big, it'll just get a nice image. So, um, having test equipment such as a logic analyzer like the uh, Salier, or as some people in my work like to call it the Salad Logic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it is Salier, so, or something like that. So, they may have like specs that the price go away. Yes, yes. So, this one I think is a uh, $1,000 one right here. But, um, they have a very gratuitous student discount, so you can actually get this for half the price, so that's what I do. Um, and uh, yeah, having a nice power supply that uh, covers pretty much up to like 36 volts is typically recommended. Uh, unless you're working with uh, any... Uh, you can see the discover is from... Uh, yeah, analog like discovery. Yeah, yeah. we're going to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. yeah. So yeah, the analog discovery has, of course, uh, it's a... It's a two channel scope and it also has some logic analyzer capabilities. It's a lot cheaper. And the software for it. Yeah, the software is really nice. It's very intuitive. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Sally A software is still kind of pretty nice. They just now added, I think, real time support for uh, analyzing logic signals. So it's kind of a nice feature for a very, for a very expensive tool. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but yeah, I highly recommend the. And I like this story just because it's a really nice uh, all-around purpose tool. And uh, and as you'll see in this case, since I flew all the way from here from Dayton, it's really compact. It's really nice to travel with. Uh, I mean, I have a ride wall at home, which... It's yeah. almost like a Raspberry Pi buggy. Yes. Like, they were like, yes. let's make exactly. And yes, uh, you can also run a Raspberry Pi with this. <laughs> you can actually run the software with the Raspberry and, Pi. Yes. And well, but the hardware is not the same. Yeah. Like the, like uh, yeah. Oh no. So you just uh, connect this via USB to your Raspberry Pi, and you can still run it. So if you have the Raspberry Pi touch screen, you can have a really nice portable, uh, like test equipment workstation without, you know, actually connecting it to your PC and using the space there. Yeah, it's really, it's really convenient. Um, actually, on that, you know, can't like break it off. And it's still so good, right? Yes, which she is, yeah, like a hundred dollars off the end, correct. So, I actually worked on a project, uh, I'll show you guys instead of talking about it. So, uh, this one actually uses the, uh, what is it, the Electronics Explorer board, which is their like higher end test instrument that has a four channel scope and it's like all fully integrated on their board. And, uh, that one, while well, before they were acquired by uh, the National Instruments, was pretty cheap with the student discount. So let's see. Yeah. So, yeah, this was really nice to travel with for a while over here. So, yeah, here you have like a 32 bit logic analyzer, four channel scope, uh, two channel arbitrary waveform generator, and uh, triple output power supply, a couple of voltage references, a whole meter in there. All in this uh, one. Okay, working so quick. As yeah. A like, yeah, as a project. student. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, a project I did at Hackathon was actually just putting this in a nice Pelican case, Pelican style kind of case, and then with the Raspberry Pi touch screen, Raspberry Pi, I was able to run that all off of there. And so, here's the SMD challenge. That's the misery vision. <laughs> yes. So yes, you can run that up. So what was the other? Uh, so you have to say like, uh, uh, what's the other one? The analog you know, like discovery by Digilant. Okay. Yeah. So that's a nice tool to add. Yeah, so, um, oh yeah, component testers. Uh, so you've probably seen these maybe on uh, Alibaba or eBay. So these are some uh, $20 component testers that can identify your inductors, capacitors, resistors, and a couple of uh, semiconductors. So it'll tell you what the pinout is, as well as some uh, characteristics like the beta and other things that are important to the transistor. And, uh, so I have also one of these at work, which this one's a little higher end, but uh, this is a dedicated uh, semiconductor analyzer. And so 
Um, this has saved me quite a few times because there are uh, weird packages, like six uh, pin SOIC packages that will have dual transistors on them. And uh, like initially you'll think, oh, it's an, it's a, it just looks like a uh, typical integrated circuit, analog integrated circuit, maybe it's an op-amp or something. But uh, you look up the part number, not, there's, there's nothing remotely close to being an op-amp uh, there. So uh, if you just like hook up uh, three of the leads to a part of that six pin SOIC, then you'll find that, oh, okay, there's a PJT there, or there's a MOSFET on the same die. Uh, that that always, I mean, at least in my case, has narrowed down my search area quite significantly. And so you just look up the part code on the S, like an SMD code book, and uh, it'll usually pop up there. So, and then uh, having uh, some debuggers and programming tools, like dedicated ones, can be nice. So, like, for example, like I have the uh, Admiral Ice debugger and programming tool, which that's kind of nice for extracting from more easily from Admiral devices. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, here. I should probably, yeah, probably pass some of the stuff around. So, here. So, uh, yeah, so for JTAG, of course, there's like open source solutions like the Blackmagic Pro. Um, and then Joe Grant's JTAGulator is one. One of those devices that's really nice for finding identifying JTAG ports. And uh, I think, uh, what's it called? Then there's the uh, Shipra that uh, can do um, some of the same things as, oh yeah, there, there's also the bus pirate. Can you put this on pizza work? Because this is like too much information. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you have like a um, easy yeah. basement yeah. there? Oh, not quite. Just pull it together. Thanks. I, yeah, uh, this is exactly what I did this time. Suggestion response. Um, yeah, so I'll probably put this on a wiki somewhere, but uh, yeah. Anyways, so yeah, one way you can find me is you can just, uh, I should probably use my business credit. But uh, if you just look up uh, Hong's Electronics on Google, and you'll, you'll, find, you'll probably find me. It's very likely to carry on based out of the email. Yeah, so some parts and consumables that are really nice to have in the lab while you're reverse engineering something. There's some uh, small, small diameter light of solder. Like some of the really thin stuff is really nice because uh, um, if you use literary thick diameter ones, then it will just have a nice big solder blob that eventually will kind of bite you later when you try to solder. Or um, it'll just kind of ruin your iron if you well, it's a Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, so anyway. Um, yeah, having a nice syringe of liquid flux yeah. is really nice for uh, removing chips. And uh, yeah, chip quick, which, no, that's what I was getting to, is chip quick. Uh, uh, you don't want to use too much of that stuff because that's low temperature solder. It'll get all over your board if you tilt your board. And uh, could ruin your day if you're trying to start the chip. And uh, having some cap on tape is really nice for uh, securing things down or making sure your jumper is not short when you're uh, breaking out uh, JTAG pins directly from or UR pins from a microcontroller or anything for a chip. Because there are cases where the uh, debug port is uh, not nicely labeled for you or you can't find it, it's just you have to either extract, if, extract the chip or just wire it to, uh, to it directly point to point. And so uh, having isopropyl alcohol to clean things up, like the flux, is really nice. With some uh, Kim 10 uh, Kim wipes, which is like the no lint wipes. Uh, you can also use microfiber cloths as well. And uh, I think as long as you use a ESD strap, you should be okay with ESD. Although I haven't really killed anything yet. Um, anyways, has anyone ever killed anything with ESD? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait, how are you doing? <laughs> Uh, video card. Oh, okay. oh, you did. Oh, you did to a video. Yeah. So you were making a, You were building a PC. And then... uh, well, it was working on a PC. Yeah. That, oh. Yeah. That was that was, that was so, stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
we had actually damaged a, a tiny SOC 23 microchip pick Ooh. device that was being used for power up and the system was starting to behave weird. We're like, what is going on? Because yes. you can't really troubleshoot <laughs> it. And we decapped it and saw there was like actual oh, like ESD damage damages. on the die. Oh, yeah. wow. Only on horrible. it was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> we wouldn't wish that on anyone. Yeah. yeah, the worst is if like, yeah, in that case, when you abuse start up to your board and then yeah, behaves rudely and then you're thinking of something else, only to find that it is yes. Um, yes, and uh, okay, guys, don't buy the wireless ESD straps. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually saw those on sale at Micro Center, uh, which is really fun. Uh, they're, they're like 20 bucks at Micro Center, and I just like looked at them. Yeah, I, I hope this is a joke. This is a gag. They can give it to someone, but but hey, at least that's the 10 big over this stream and everything. So it's the most important part. And uh, yep, having an assortment of passives is your typical uh, resistor endocrine capacitance. So I like, uh, I think I have in the, yeah, so that's a resistor book. So that one specifically, the 0603, having that is really nice just so that if you're uh, replacing parts or um, you happen to lose one of those surface mount parts in the, into the ether with your uh, tweezers, you will have like, a nice assortment of them. And uh, you can easily source the 0402s, the you know, 603s, and the 0803s, and 1206 from like 8 or 3 on the day. And they're like roughly around like 30 bucks. So it's just a nice thing to have. Uh, and uh, having a nice assortment of adapters. So, so it's that, that bulk is 30 bucks? Yeah, yeah, like it's like a thousand components or something. Like, yeah, they see that they advertise it. And uh, most of them are like this, or they're like all slotted. Yeah, most of them are actually combined like resistor and capacitor packages. So, yeah, so adapters, probes, probe pins, and headers are really nice to have around because if you want to easily connect things without uh, directly soldering wires. Because uh, yeah, it, as much as I like to, they, to talk myself into saying, oh, like it'll, it once you wire something up, it'll be fine. It'll, no, it's gonna break. <laughs> it's very likely it's gonna break. Really. So just just having uh, using it as uh, many connected as you can is really nice. Um, so yeah, having various amounts of probe board or different types of probe board, like the uh, Sparkfun uh, Snapple probe board. So uh, you'll see in this grid, these are all actually all just what is that uh, uh, perforated, so you can just snap those into nice pieces. And uh, it's really nice for uh, breaking stuff out, making <coughs> cool adapters with that. And, so you uh, just can't do it, it's just advanced Yeah, exactly. And uh, I think it's like a 60 by 60 grid or something. Or no, it's a rectangle, so it's like 60 by 30. Uh, eight points, is really nice. And then, uh, so as I said with the component analyzers, they're probably going around, yeah. So, what I typically like to do is, what if I run into those like bizarre like SOT uh, 363 packages, I think that's what they are, like the six pin uh, ones with like two transistors, I'll typically just isolate them on this kind of like uh, surface mount probe board and then just uh, use this to identify it. So, is that a logic probe? Oh no, this is a semiconductor analyzer, so they'll tell you what uh, uh, what kind of transistor devices or a diode or an LED. And it'll even give you the pinout because a lot of those they'll have like you know, the uh, the base. Um, oh yeah, it'll just have the pinouts mixed uh, um, completely from like the diagram. So we have to, it's nice to have that. So. Sorry. Oh no, it's okay. <laughs> What what is the IR port on that device for? Oh, oh on, on on this? Yeah. Okay, so um, it's an extra feature. You you can apparently decode your remote control with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, I was like, just okay, I don't know what it, it, it's pretty cool. Like I it actually it actually works, but um, it just it just makes me wonder like why. <laughs> But hey, maybe that could, that's like another kind of like optics mm -hmm. line. Yeah. <laughs> Which, yep, yeah, shout out to Joe Grand again. The optics line. Mm -hmm. Nice side uh, <laughs> analysis tool. I'm not even paying them. This is amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know where they are. 
<laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, uh, oh yeah, I probably, probably forgot to mention this. So, uh, as you get uh, deeper into this, if, if you if you do run into like uh, systems with crypto modules or there is encryption running, there is, uh, as Bunny said this morning, the Chip Whisperer, which is a pretty cool side channel analysis tool. Um, it's it's kind of crazy how you can use all like those kind of statistics to extract the keys, and uh, it's really cool. Highly recommend it. So yes, that's that. So, yeah, I'm trying to stay away from my cycling slides, but I have a few more things I want to do this. So <laughs> so. Um, yeah, when you're when you're a designer, you have to realize that uh, a wire is not just a wire anymore. It becomes a um, what is this done? Or what? what wires become like? Uh, yeah, oh, no, it's not angle, but like it'll, it'll it'll become it'll, it'll start to exhibit properties at high frequency as an inductor and resistor in series. So yeah, you can get all sorts of bizarre things from that if you don't play out your board properly. So if designers put in a lot of effort to make sure that a lot of this stuff is mitigated for, and uh, yeah, it's, it's all about optimizing board performance and reducing those parasitics. And uh, yeah, it, it's what saves time and money as well. And uh, yeah, just knowing those rules to reduce your time in design already because uh, there's a lot of cases well, where you'll see that maybe uh, you'll have two lines where there's a digital signal and uh, there's a resistor in between, so you can't quite use a continuity test. It's kind of like just like on the border. Like it'll, it'll, like the flip multimeter will actually show that, oh, like there's 120 ohms here, but it won't start beeping. And uh, if, you, if you use the method of uh, actually like Clipping onto one of the leads on that uh, on, on, on a part, and then kind of just using the connecting fabric, you'll sometimes find that oh, it goes into this resistor, and then that resistor, the other end of that resistor goes into another chip. Because uh, one thing that they try to do is kind of uh, slow down the edges on your on those digital signals so that you don't get like spurious RF signals, because uh, the FCC doesn't like that. Or you don't want other traces on your boards picking that up as crosstalk or other various things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yep, the biggest help for anything with uh, hardware design is uh, layout rules and layout reference designs. And uh, as hardware reverse engineers, this is also very useful because um, typically uh, you'll see that the uh, part will actually exactly match some of these layouts. As I found, and uh, yeah, it's it's because design engineers don't want to take it all risks. And uh, even with like J something like JTAG, uh, it even has a finite distance that it can run at, so uh, less than five inches. So that can, on a bigger board, that could probably reduce your time in trying to find where the JTAG board is, because uh, that's a signal that runs around 20 megahertz. So if you don't uh, properly lay that out, that could easily, um, that signal probably would make it to the connector if you lay your board correctly in 20 megahertz. Yes, your traces become low pass filters. So, yep, there's all this stuff in data sheets, really good stuff, just like, uh, hey, make sure your inductors are close, make sure your capacitors are close. And, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing because a lot of the boards that I look at at work, they'll exactly copy the reference design. It's like, wow. Um, it's, just like, it's, it's not that the designers were not creative or anything. It's just that it just saves so much time and uh, avoid, it avoids so many problems. Just sticking with the reference layout. And, yep, some of them will actually give you layer by layer. Like, so this is actually from a uh, text instrument this data sheet. Uh, I think analog devices also does a good job, and yeah, there's a lot of them have that, and that's the same slide. So in the meantime, anyone have any questions?
Have you ever seen components embedded in boards, no. either either physical components no. or the the board yeah. substrate and you know Cut materials so being used? I, I wish I could say yes, to that because it would be really cool to see one of those. But no, uh, I think yeah. Another thing that KT points out in his book is, is that that is a very uh, that's that's a very good countermeasure against hardware use actually embedding components within inner layers. So like you'll actually have like all these passives or integrated circuits like actually within like your board. So as I was saying earlier, I used I worked on a forty layer board at one point. At, uh, pre that's definitely a place. Yeah. What <laughs> but, what's what's the key clearance? Yeah. I can't say that. <laughs> 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 you, you know, you know, good, good try though. Yeah. So with all the stuff you all the stuff you've seen is mostly that like the table of obfuscation of stuff from the yes that you've seen yeah. yeah. Um, so actually, let's go back to that sentence. Wait, how, do you, how do you laminate a forty-layer board? So, uh, uh, <laughs> I, so, so the cool thing was, I actually, I actually got to talk with a lot of those uh, field applications engineers and uh, salespeople. It's <coughs> funny how they assemble those forty-layer boards. Is they'll do that actually in a vacuum, and uh, they'll just like you know put down the epoxy and just like build it up layer by layer, and. Uh, so the interesting part is I learned is there is no warranty for that sort of thing. So if one of your boards is like just dead on arrival, then yeah, you're out like, like 10 or 8 grand at that point. And your design, <laughs> your design rules are totally different. What kind of tools are you using? Uh, there I used uh, Mentor graphics, mm -hmm. like uh, pads, and uh, I worked heavily with uh, hyperlinks, uh, signal integrity, and car integrity tools. And what's the driving? Um, Choice to um, what's the driving design decision that says, Oh, we need to go 40 for this? Is it so obfuscation or is it? Oh, no, so distributed that's, element filters or is it you know, the is it interesting more part is, is that a lot of things like that are that complicated. Uh, typically, obfuscation is, yeah, once again, like the last thing you think about, but kind of like unintentionally you do so. So, like, uh, <laughs> which is like it's like it's a benefit and a disadvantage if you're a hardware reverse engineer. Like it makes your job harder if you're trying to reverse engineer a board, but uh, in this case it was like a almost like a 2,000 pin like uh, Xilinx Ultra Scale at PGA. So um, okay. yeah, doing that like kind of double side your typical double side four layer board is not possible. Like, there's no way you're gonna break out all those uh, signals out. And well, so people at hacker cons are more and more like, oh, let's do a PGA. Let's have the PGA uh, drum soldering workshop. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so the, is wow. that, what tools are they going to use when they really want to get serious about using a high density device? Like a high density device like that. Ooh. So, man. software, hardware, what kind of tools? Like X ray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, yeah. I a little table So, it, if I recall, I think the one floor that we got dead on arrival, we just like ended up thing. sending back and then they did end up servicing it, but for like a pretty hefty fee that I don't know about. Probably a lot. Uh, but anyway, so we really qualify that as an outside. Oh, it is there. <laughs> so, um, so the meta graphics stuff is really expensive. Oh yeah, it's like I know uh, the guy who's like a sales engineer. Uh, the dual seat is and with all the things I said, it's like eighty thousand dollars or something per year. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Like, it's, it's it's like crazy. <laughs> I mean, it's it's highly doubtful that in the hobby world you will end up ever doing a board that complicated. But yeah, like I think yeah. So most of the things like you yeah do in high cat eagle looks like what well, max like ten layers I think typically. Which even at that point, yeah, like sourcing a fad and everything is pretty expensive at that point. So yes, uh, yeah. So. Yeah, I didn't run into any embedded components, but it is that's also mentioned in the book as a countermeasure. Um, most of the time, I mean, yeah, like it's more like a design position sometimes more than it is a reverse engineering countermeasure because it's like it's just convenient to have some of those components oh, like it's embedded it's in the board. Yeah, well, at the really same hard. time, yeah, it, it's like a countermeasure. I, I hear about it all the time, but I've never actually. Yeah, I never run into it. Either, yeah, so. like I. I <laughs> I mean, I, I think the only time I've ever heard about it was uh, like in, in school because we're right next to uh, Air Force Research Lab in Dayton and uh, I've heard that there are boards there that do implement that kind of technology where like they actually will put uh, 
embedded components and like literally circuit board surgery is a thing when you're trying to service one of those. If like one of those embedded components goes out, you actually, um, I think I've heard that there's methods where they'll like, yeah, they'll x-ray the boards and then they'll like try to find a drill point and then they have to like reassemble the board like layer up from there. It's like, it's just like, it's so ridiculous. I, I really wish I could see it. Could you full screen that? Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so this is actually a table that's pulled out from the book, but uh, yeah, these are some protection levels that uh, you, that some, you might run into. So, uh, I mean, most of the things these days that you'll run into probably don't even go as far as three. Like, four and five basically is where like the manufacturer will like, in, implement crypto or something. Or like one of those embedded boards where there's actually like components. With that said, uh, yeah, Joe, the other, I guess the thing that I guess was embedded is we did have this like special, uh, I think it was dielectric that acted like a capacitor yeah. between, yeah, so some planes. But other than that, like, there, I, I haven't run into any, like, actually, like, components. Yeah, definitely beyond FR4. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> how, how are you able to figure out that dielectric, like, are there markings on it that or if it's just like, that looks different than FR. Yeah, that looks different, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, Roger thinks there's some composite. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Rogers is, yeah, 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 it looks, yeah that's it looks very different common. Enough that, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was stuff I think where, like the top layer we ran some like oh, Rogers, that was doing some like very high speed internet, as well as some of the RF stuff. Let's see, yeah, so, but yeah, um, I mean, at this point, uh, like level five, and yeah, so four or five, typically that's like your, the people who attack those kinds of things are like your state-run laboratories or huge organizations. And so yeah, that's kind of goes more into what actual things to do. So four or five, as I said, are crypto, or they're like super complex ASICs, where they might implement some kind of uh, tamper-resistant tech. So, yeah, so things like this where you can clearly see where uh, analog and digital are kind of are demarcated here. Like, there's literally like a split through this thermal pad. And you'll see it kind of goes up through here. You're talking about like a, it's isolation. Yeah, it's isolation. Yeah. 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 And uh, the the book of uh, <coughs> fantastic job. It almost like that that I think it's chapter three may override. It just like kind of puts you in that reverse psychology of being like a design engineer, and then uh, you can easily uh, use those concepts to uh, your reverse engineering work because I mean. I think yeah, pretty much. I think if you read the book, um, the, uh, you you won't really look at a circuit board the same. You'll you won't you won't be like, whoa, that's really complicated. You'll be like, oh, I see power supply, I see the analog section, the power section. Which book? This, this one. Oh yeah, yeah, the PCBRE. That's. Oh, I don't know if you were. If you were I don't know. Actually, this. Yeah, Is that on Amazon? Yeah, that's on Amazon. It's forty bucks. Forty bucks, something like that. And uh, the cool thing is, is that uh, if you tell the author you bought the book, he'll give you uh, all these other cool resources like uh, actual like SMD cookbook that's pretty comprehensive and some uh, Visio templates and other cool freebies that come with the book. And yeah, unfortunately there is no ebook copy because the author doesn't want to be subject to piracy or anything. So. Yeah, I, I wish there was an ebook version. I would pay a lot of money for it. Um, <laughs> So, once again, like here, uh, he goes over this in the book, but uh, typically what a lot of design engineers will want to do is between like different planes, they, won't, they don't want planes to overlap because it will cause some capacitance and like, some of your signals will like, be coupled, which is really bad because you'll run into some really undesirable effects. It will be a barrier to debugging. Yeah, it's the same slide. Did you make those slides as part of a study or something, or you just start it? Oh, no, this is from a previous presentation. Yeah. Yeah, because a lot of the stuff like overlap. 
stuff, so. Yeah. This is a cool book. Yeah, it's a fantastic. Yeah, there's literally no book like it, so. Um, oh, yeah, so other links, I guess, like, to the running too. Yeah, so there's that. Finalize. Yep, there's the book. <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm surprised you looked at your tool setup. You didn't go over anything Foxtown type tool to oh. inject it. Oh, I don't know. Oh, yeah. oh, what? Uh, Foxtown? Yeah. Like a pro, like an inject, like a single injector. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, like yeah. Single, yeah. So, Bunny mentioned that this morning. I think even like with like the H field probes. <laughs> yep. So, like, exactly. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, like once again, it's like a specialized tool that you can. Uh, it's nice depending on your application. So far, I haven't run into a, a, a problem where I actually needed to use one. Yes. Yeah. So for the, for the conductive testing, uh, one of the things that I've also found that works really, really well is taking the moisture wire and spraying it and then using it kind of like a brush. Yeah, like a brush. Yeah. So Joe mentioned at our last conference that there used to be a manufacturer that actually made specifically a brush. But I guess they stopped. There's the Wave Wave 10 SF10. Yeah. Like, well, I've been trying to find one for years. I mean, yeah. I don't know why they would discontinue such a great tool. Yeah. There's probably not that many people doing reverse yeah. engineering. Oh, yeah, that, that, that's true. It. It's, it's a very specialized yeah, title. It's <laughs> a so, job. So. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, really, you, you really want the stretchy kind because that's what will get all your other nooks and crannies and also any hats. <laughs> so, um, I happen to have, yes, yeah, so I used uh, one that was not as stretchy, and so the problem with that is, is that if you uh, try to push it down on certain pads or you just brush it, uh, you won't make good contact. You won't get that like, nice uh, contact with some of those pads or. Uh, I don't know, sometimes you might have to clean up the board beforehand with some isopropyl to get some, uh, some of the oxidation off.